We turn this evening to Revelation chapter 2, and I'll read verse 1. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We could summarize this church as a good church with a serious flaw. What a warning it is against complacency in church life, but also in our personal lives. Before we come to that, I'd like to try just briefly to give you a key to the book of Revelation. You should have had a a little bookmark, which I've provided for you, with an outline. The book of Revelation is not strictly chronological. It is and it isn't. But if we just begin at chapter 2 and then read chapter by chapter thinking that each chapter follows on in chronological sequence, we will find that this book is very difficult to grasp and understand. Once we realize that this book is comprised of seven sections. We could call them the acts or the scenes in a drama. Seven depictions of life. And that they run parallel to each other. Then we begin to glean some light. I'm not suggesting there are not difficult verses and things that we may be left perplexed and puzzled by. But it will help us a great deal if we appreciate that this is the structure of the book. I don't think it's the case completely nowadays, but years ago when you had a colour printing press, then if you wanted to print in the various colours, then the piece of paper, I believe, used to have to pass through the printing press four or five times. It would go through with the yellow, and then with the red, then with the green or blue, and then with the black. And each time that piece of paper went through the press, the picture that was intended to be reproduced on the page grew in clarity. And there is a sense in which that is the way we must understand the book of Revelation. Each of these seven scenes convey us from the time of John down to the return of Christ at the end of time and the judgment day and the settlement of God's people in eternal glory and the banishing of the wicked in eternal ruin. And those seven scenes, as they go through the book of Revelation, they are like the different colors on that press. And each time we are taken through that time period, a little extra detail is provided to our understanding. There are seven. You know that the number seven is regarded as a complete number, seven days in a week. And there are seven scenes. There's a wonderful numerical harmony to the book of Revelation. You get to the end of the seven scenes and we have God's complete picture that is conveyed to us of what life in the New Testament era between the days of the apostles and the return of Christ will be like. With those passing scenes, the spotlight falls increasingly at a later period. 
So here, the first scene is Christ in the midst of the seven candlesticks. The focus is very much upon the time of John himself. These were real living churches. We'll come to why these seven churches were written to in a moment. But the focus was upon John's own time, period, but not exclusively. If you look at the end of this first letter to the church at Ephesus, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Then look at verse 11, the end of the message to the church at Smyrna. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Even here, those who are addressed are trained in their minds to look to the end of time itself. And that's how we have to view our lives as believers. Certainly, it was the case for these early believers in a very persecuting Roman Empire. Look to the end. Look to that time when the Savior will return. Those who endure, who overcome, what blessings await. That's the underlying message of the end of these individual messages to the seven churches. So here is the first scene. It begins at the beginning of verse 1, at the beginning of chapter 2. It concludes at the end of chapter 3. And we may call this scene Christ in the midst of the candlesticks or in the midst of his churches. These were real churches, but they were at the same time representative churches. They represent all of the church of Jesus Christ. If you look at uh, verse 7 here, for example, we read, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This letter, though it is written to Ephesus, Ephesus is a representative church, and all are to hear. Every believer is to lay to heart this message that is conveyed here to the messenger, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Some have mistakenly suggested that these seven churches represent seven different eras throughout the New Testament age. There was first the Ephesian era, they would say. Then there was the era of Smyrna. And that was typical of the church of that second era. And they would add, most of these uh, interpreters, we are now in the Laodicean era. We're neither hot nor cold. Complacently, see, a set in. And the Lord warns us. But that's not the true understanding of these verses. I'm sure of that. This is a message concerning the New Testament church age. And throughout the New Testament church age, what will the church look like? Sometimes it will look like the church at Ephesus. Sometimes it will look like the church at Smyrna or Thyatira or Philadelphia. There will be churches throughout the New Testament age that are in danger through persecution. And there is much encouragement here from Christ for his persecuted people. Others will be exposed to the peril of false apostles and false teachers. And they need to be alert and watchful. That's a message here. There will be others that are in danger of both. Persecution, the threat of, uh, of, of martyrdom, but also false teaching. Some will be in danger of backsliding, growing cold, losing their first love. This is not one particular era within the church age. This is something that will manifest itself throughout. Are we discouraged when we sit, survey the local churches of Jesus Christ in our day, 
we see some buffeted through the bitterness of, uh, of martyrdom. We see others snared by false teaching and we think, is Christ really on the throne? Is the church really going to flourish according to God's predetermined program? Well, yes. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 tell us this will be typical of the church age. We can be reassured, but we shouldn't be complacent. It's no use us reading this letter to the church at Ephesus and say, we're well, so reassuring. But, well, we may become like this as a church, and the Lord has foretold it. Well, not really. We cannot. We have to be alert. There are strong words of warning here to the church at Ephesus and to all who have an ear to hear. And so it is a message to us. Ephesus, there will be, if, if, if Ephesus-type churches throughout the era, the age. That's what we're being told here. Well, Ephesus was a city where to be a church was not easy. It was part of the Roman world, but it was also an idolatrous city. The great temple of the goddess Diana cast its proverbial shadow over the whole city. People were immoral. People were wealthy. There were false teachers, false apostles here too. It's clear from this reference to those that uh, say they are apostles and are not. And so there is a message that goes out to this church. We need to look at it now because it will apply to us too. Now each church in this group of seven, there are seven scenes, but then there are also seven churches. That tells us that it's a message to the complete church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in each occasion, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who speaks, and he uses a different title for himself for each of these different churches. And each of those titles is borrowed from the vision that Christ, uh, of Christ that John had seen in chapter 1. And so here in verse 1 of chapter 2, the Lord styles himself as he that holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Why does he designate himself in this way to this particular church. I suggest to you that each of these titles is tailored to the particular church situation to whom the Lord writes. Here he is reminding us and the Ephesian church that he is the true source of truth and authority. He holds the seven stars in his hand. Yes, they are his pastors. He sends every true faithful minister. They are accountable to him. But ultimately, it's a reminder to the church here that he is the source of truth. But then why does he speak of the seven golden candlesticks as the one in whom... Uh, uh, why does he refer to himself as the one who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, perhaps here to jolt a church from presumption and complacency, but also every individual. Christ is in the midst this evening. He walks in the midst of his churches. He takes an active interest in them. He's then going to add, verse 2, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, and so on. I know here. It uses a word that refers to intimate, personal knowledge. Christ is in heaven, and yet at the same time, he views with interest 
and with perception all that takes place in his churches. When we set foot in the gathered church of Jesus Christ, we need to be mindful that he is in the midst in a special way, in a way that he is not in the midst of the world. He is in the midst of his people, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It's been suggested, just as Samuel of old, in that temple, he attended the candlestick. He had to trim the lamps. He had to maintain, provide oil, see that that lamp continued to burn brightly. Christ walks in the midst of his churches in order to ensure that his church burns all the more brightly. If he sees a church that is burning dull, he may trim the wick. He may attend to it. He may graciously sustain it through granting that supply of oil. Often in scripture, an emblem of the spirit of God. Christ is in the midst. Do we say, oh Lord, I would burn more brightly as a testimony to thy grace. As a church, do we say, oh, that we were much more a shining light to a dark world? Then we look to Christ. He is in the midst. In one sense, he is the priest who trims the lamp, who maintains the light. It's part of his duty. There's something encouraging here to begin with, but at the same time, searching. I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, perseverance. The Lord is saying here, I know the measure or the effort of your works in the service of the gospel. He's also implying here, I know the circumstances in which you labor. I know what it's like in Bulldog. I know how hard the hearts of the general population are. I know that you toil. That's what he was saying to this church. Works and then labor is the toiling word. Sometimes we may feel that we are weary, but the Lord knows. He sees. And thy patience he knows when we persevere, when we are discouraged and downcast. He knows too the motives with which we serve. Do we serve out of duty? And we are not really concerned zeal, with any burning zeal for his honor and glory, for the advantage of his kingdom, the honor of his name. Are we motivated by being able to say, look what I've done as a Christian? Are we motivated by a sense of, well, I suppose I ought to? The Lord sees. He knows the caliber of our works, the manner in which we approach. He sees our prayer meetings. He knows whether we just go through the motions or whether we say, I know thy works. I know that the reason you gather is because you are so concerned as a body of believers to know the gracious help and power of God in your midst. So it's searching, but it's also encouraging. In almost all of these churches, there is a con commendation and a condemnation. And that's certainly the case with Ephesus. There is a commendation first of all we've already touched on it but there are four things that the church at Ephesus is commended for that gives to us an insight in those things that our heavenly master delights to see in the midst of his people he delights in these things and so let's go through them I'll try and be brief because I want to give you a a complete outline of this message. 
Firstly, the Lord takes pleasure in a working church, in a serving people. The words that we've just looked at suggest as much. The New Testament constantly uses pictures to describe, to depict the local church as a body of believers who labor together. The church is described as a farm. You are God's husbandry, he says. There is planting and watering to be done. And so if the Lord calls us to be members of his local church, his kingdom, then we expect I am to be a planter, a waterer, a tender. The church is described as a building site. Well, I know that there are some building sites where it looks as if there are, there's one person working and three council officials making sure the job's done properly. But that's not really the picture, is it? A building site. The church is made up of those who are builders, laboring together, toiling together to erect a spiritual edifice. The church is a flock. What does the shepherd do with sheep that neither produce wool or lambs? They're good for nothing. Even that picture of a flock, it suggests that all members of the flock are to be fruitful. They are to be part of that enterprise. And so you could go a vine. Every branch in the vine is to be fruit bearing. And here, we know we're reminded that the Lord took pleasure in the labors of his people at Ephesus. There is much to be done here, brothers and sisters at Bulldog. There are tasks that you each can commend yourself to, make yourself available to. We are all busy. We all have many personal demands upon us. But if you have little way in which to serve the Lord, then lay yourself open. Speak to one of the office bearers and say, here am I, send me. What can I do? How can I be part of that spiritual enterprise of Jesus Christ? Then secondly, the church here is commended because it strove for sound doctrine. Verse 2, thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. They were proving, testing false teachers. They rejected those things that were not consistent. We live in a day, sad to say, when there are many churches that seem relatively unconcerned about being careful and precise in doctrine. They will say something, well, as long as you all love Jesus, it doesn't really matter what you believe. We're all going in the same direction, but that's not the spirit that the Lord commends here. We're not to be judgmental and unnecessarily harsh, but the Lord delights in a discerning church and in a church that stands for the truth and rejects those things which are clearly against key doctrine in his word. We mustn't be conditioned by a modern society that says you mustn't be distinctive. You mustn't be forthright in contending for positions that others reject. Thirdly, the church here was intolerant of sinful lifestyle. In verse 2, there's a reference to those, to the church that could not bear them which are evil, wicked, unholy. Verse 6, this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now we're not told specifically what these deeds were, but later on there's a reference to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And it is thought that this is a reference to the spirit of some who said, well, you become a Christian, but then you live like everybody else in Ephesus. 
You're saved by grace. And therefore you can continue in sin that grace may abound. It was thought to represent licensed worldliness. You do not need to be distinct as a Christian. I was reading a sermon the other day by uh, an old preacher. You'll know, some of you will know him, Septimus Sears. And uh, he describes three characteristics of a Christian. He's saying to his congregation, well, if you have to describe a Christian, how do you describe a Christian? And he said, the second mark of his description is this. A Christian is someone who loves holiness. It's true, isn't it? Holiness ought to be something that we aspire to, that we are jealous for. It ought to grieve us when there are those that profess Christ who seem to be careless about separation from the world and uh, sin. A Christian ought to be with holy jealousy concerned to live a life that is pure and right and pleasing to the Lord. If we listen to the same raucous music as the world, we watch the same films with the bad language and the violence that the world take pleasure in, does that mean that the Lord is going to take pleasure in us? If we are pleasure-seeking and leisure-seeking in the way the world makes this their God, the Lord is not pleased. But fourthly, we see here that the church at Ephesus was commended because they bore or they persevered despite hardness and hardship. They persevered. They bore, verse 3, thou hast borne and hast patience and for my sake, my, my namesake, hast labored and hast not fainted. Now I don't think here the Lord is saying in this verse that He's not referring to those who are physically weary and ought to press on when they can't. But he's referring here to that resilient spirit. That with all the help that the Lord gives, the church persevered. So these are things which the Lord takes great pleasure in. And there was so much to commend this church. It was a working church. It was orthodox in its doctrine. It was careful about holiness. It persevered. You could say that uh, many people would be keen to join this church. It ticks a lot of boxes. And yet the Lord identifies a serious flaw in this particular local church. So serious that he says that unless they repent, he will remove the candlestick. In other words, this church, it will still exist. It will still be a body of people, may even have genuine people in it, but it will forfeit its instrumentality. The Lord won't bless it with gospel fruit. The Lord won't permit it to be a light-bearing church that conveys the gospel to his honor in the world. It's going to forfeit one of its key reasons of existence. What is that serious flaw? Thou hast left thy first love. We can be in no doubt what this means. The church, viewed as individuals, by and large, had lost that tender intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ that it had. Those that were once at the first time of their conversion were so anxious to walk with the Lord, they delighted in his attributes, they wondered at his mercy and kindness, they kept close, feared to offend, anxious to please, but they've left that first love. 
Brothers and sisters, how easy it is for us to be guilty of this same sin. The times when we were so enthralled with the things of God has waned, perhaps. That anxiety to spend time with the Lord in prayer day by day that readiness to spend and be spent in his cause and in his kingdom. It's not there anymore. We allow earthly things to rob our affections of, from Christ. We allow the busyness of life. It may be legitimate busyness, but these things have so overwhelmed us and distracted us that those cords of affection that were once reserved for Christ, are no longer there. It's so easy. And yet the Lord views it and warns against it with such force here in writing to this church. You could say that here was a church that even though it was very busy, they had lost their emphasis on what used to be called heart religion that experiential emphasis that true Christian experience is part of what it means to be a Christian. To a certain extent, it was a dry orthodoxy. They could preach good sermons, well-structured, biblical in content, and yet there was no real affection no real conviction, nothing really to woo the soul to Christ. And the Lord urged them to reconsider. Well, we can, we can speak for ourselves, can't we? We have to search our own hearts rather than point the fingers at one another here. Have I left my first love? Or am I as anxious to live close to the Lord Jesus Christ as once I did. And if I have left my first love, and probably this is the key, because sometimes the Lord hides his face in order to prove us. Do we cry out to him? Are we like Cowper, as we'll sing in a, in a moment, saying, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? I want that back. Lord, draw near. Bless me afresh with a sense of divine things and the preciousness of my Savior and the blessedness of that close walk with him. If I've lost it, then how do I respond? If we still love him, then we mourn his absence. We crave by prayer his return. The Lord in his sovereignty must give it. Do we fear to grieve the Lord? Do we meditate upon his attributes, his offices, his person, his promises, his kindness? Do we stand amazed at that depiction of Christ that is set before us in the Gospels, saying, what a blessed Savior is mine. I delight in him. I long to know him more I long for that day when I will see him face to face. The Lord says to this church, remember, verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. How this must have pricked the pride, the balloon of this church, if it was proud of its many works, its orthodoxy, its steadfast Emphasis upon holiness. All commendable traits. But the Lord says you've fallen because you've left your first love. And that's a vital part of what it means to be a healthy church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and do the first works or else. Threatening language, isn't it? What are the first works here? Well, I suggest to you, it's those 
Christian basics, the ABC of the Christian life. Heartfelt worship, meditation, self-examination, prayer. These are the holy exercises that the Lord delights in. Yes, he must give that sweet affection. He must draw near and bless our souls. But if we are concerned, then we do the first works and we look to him to draw near. And the Lord has said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. If we neglect all those spiritual exercises that as Christians we are called to do, then we cannot expect the Lord to return in blessing. We must draw to a conclusion. Look here at the end of verse 7. The Lord is so tender towards his people, even though he has this stern warning for this church. He adds, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That was the tree that Adam and Eve were banished from the garden for, so, so that they would be prevented from eating of this tree, this tree that ensured eternal life, but not simply existence, but real, deep, spiritual, eternal life. That's the promise here that the Lord gives to his church, to him that overcometh. Persevere despite all the threats that you may face as a church, as believers. Overcome all those temptations to grow cold and to grow careless. If we repent when, we have grow, when we've left our first love, the Lord has promised he will draw near. What a blessing is here set before us. And we remember that these things are part of this opening scene. The church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament era. Some will be like Ephesus. Sometimes we may be like Ephesus. But at other times we may be like Philadelphia. There's much here to encourage but also to search our souls. May the Lord bless his word to us. We close our worship with 521. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame. 521.